everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Christina Lively, and I'm the program manager for the Master of Medical Sciences in Global Health Delivery at Harvard Medical School. We are celebrating our 10th anniversary this, this year. Uh, we've launched in 2020, sorry, 2012. So 2022 marks our, our 10th year, but we're celebrating 2022, 2023. We're just going to keep celebrating. Um, but as part of the celebration, we are holding these a uh, series of panels, a series of talks with alumni, just to learn more about their great work and share that work with other people. In case you're not familiar, the MMS CGHD, the Master of Medical Sciences in Global Health Delivery is a two-year master's program and one year taking courses across Harvard University and then and they develop a thesis project. And then during the second year, they go and they do that thesis project. And the thesis projects um, often are uh, contribute to improving health in the sites where they occur. So Monica gonzalez Bunster this morning is one of our alumni and we're just so excited to have her here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'll just explain a little bit about how this will work and then I'll turn it over to Joya. So we will have Monica talk about her work and Joya will do a little introduction, then we'll have Monica talk about her work, and then we'll have question and answer time. Uh, and for those on the call, you can put your questions in the, in the Q&A. If you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A uh, box. We're going to have people type their questions, and we will spend time in discussion with Monica after she gives her talk. So... Um, let's see, what else do I need to say? Anything? We do have a, one more talk in this series, and that's on May 5th. And it will be with one of our panelists for that talk is here, Jafet, and then two other people as well, Everard Nahimana and uh, Zarni Tun, and that'll be on health systems. But today we're talking about understanding the quality of life for people living with mobility disabilities. And I'll turn it over to you, Joy. Great. Thank you, Christina. And thank you so much for joining us, Monica. Um, I Thank just, you. yeah, I want to go back to how we first met Monica. We were in the line for immigration in the Johannesburg airport. And I see these two women um, and I feel that I should know them. And I hear them talking about NANO, Malawi, which is where I was headed and they were headed. And NANO is rarely on the map. And we started talking. And I learned about the Walkabout Foundation, which Monica had founded um, as a way to be, you know, part of the global disability rights community. And they were bringing wheelchairs, they were teaching people how to do maintenance on them. Um, and they were filling such a critical gap um, in our delivery of care to people with mobility disabilities around the world. And uh, Monica was there with her daughter, Carolina. And um, I saw the passion, particularly from Monica, both of them, of course, but particularly from Monica. And, you know, really her personal story, which was so moving and the way she had put what we talk about is social suffering into moral action. And I said, you really should come join us in the uh, program for global health delivery. And she thought I was talking to her daughter <laughs> and I was talking That's to right. her. <laughs> and so Monica continues to be a force. Her research was really looking at some of the poorest people on earth, uh, those in Haiti who have mobility disabilities and her work really elucidated not only the physical mobility uh, issues, but the structural issues that they face, the social suffering um, that they experience. And so we're just delighted to have Monica, who is such, you know, such a pillar of her class, uh, having everyone in Haiti with her at one point. Uh, and also just a, a, you know, an absolutely thoughtful activist for this important topic um, and scholar. So Monica, I'll turn it over to you. Thank okay, you I'll very much. I'll just thank, share the slides. Uh -huh. Thank you, Joya, and thank you, Christina, for giving me this opportunity to come and talk to everybody about this very special program, which I love with all my heart. It has a very special place in my heart. And um, I feel very, very proud and very, first of all, very happy, very proud and excited to, to always belong. 
um, right now. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of um, disabilities. A little. Bit. We don't see it, Christina. Um, Sorry, I'm. Oh, can you see the slides? Ah, okay, right. So um, when I came into the program, I was uh, um, one of the members of the second cohort, which was a very small one, only eight of us. As the program kept on growing, now they have a lot more, as you all know. But uh, I was one of the, you know, um, eight people of the second cohort. So I came with mobility disabilities, as Joya was telling us. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, my thesis was all about people, the quality of life of people with mobility disabilities. So as you all know, or maybe you don't know, there's about 1 billion people living in the world with mobility disabilities, which makes it a one out of seven. Uh, most of these 80% of the people live in developing countries and about 150 million children live with mobility disabilities under the age of 18. So you can imagine. The burden that they have is that they are two times more likely to find inadequate health care in their lives, three times more likely to, that they cannot find the adequate health care, so they are denied of the health care, or four times more that they, they are treated not like they should be treated like all of us, because they are in this case, you know, in a wheelchair or, or lying around the floor, and 1.5 more times likely to suffer more expenditures because of their uh, condition. So all of these brings us that the, um, the next slide, uh, Christina. Next slide. Uh, so, so it brings us to this uh, social burden that they have. So they have a stigma, they have vulnerability. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will just tell you fast that uh, they have physical and psychological challenges. They have vulnerability. They are very at risk of more poverty. They have burden to their families as well as to themselves. I mean, they are isolated. They have fewer opportunities, less education. I mean, we can, the list can go forever. So um, the next one is like, there are about 800,000 people in, in Haiti that live with some type of, dis, of disability. This is when I made my thesis. So my thesis, remember that it was done in 2015 about, so it could have changed a little bit. But from the earth, we, we had 300,000 more people suffering disabilities, I mean, in Haiti, mobility disabilities even, which is worse because um, some other ones are, are you know, considered not, not seeing, not hearing. But in this case, there were a lot of injured people because of the earthquake. So I started my, my research like asking, what is the experience of living with a mobility disability in Haiti? Or what impact does it have you know, on, on people that already have a wheelchair? Would they change their life? How would it change their lives and the life of the people that help them? But here, after doing all the research, which my Richard was done um, as, a, a quality, um, as a mixed method study, and I'll explain to you a little bit more because we have, uh, okay, uh, we have the the slide that where I did it, but my, I did a mi mix mix method study that is a combination of first you do a qualitative and you find um, what the people tell you about, and with the results of that study, then you go and um, change the World Health Organization questionnaire that they have already and you can modify it and add it and do a more expensive, extensive uh, risk, uh, questionnaire to do the quantitative, which would be more like 130 people. In the other one were like about 30 people handicapped in a wheelchair and the 30 caregivers. It was very interesting to find out. I had my study location in Haiti was, had to be all over the place because I knew that it was very difficult to just find all these people in one place. They don't all live around the hospital. It's impossible. So you have to really uh, concentrate in the hospitals that they can help you and give you the people that they know 
and then also go further out and start asking in other locations, in other people, word by mouth, where can I find them? Because sometimes, you know, the problem with, with the disabilities, mobility disabilities, is that they have this stigma that, you know, people don't want them to know that they have them in their house, or they are um, marginalized, they, they don't, you know, they have all these different um, ways of thinking that maybe it's because something happened, somebody in the family did something wrong, and then, you know, they, they curse them. So it's hard to find them, but you have to stick to your efforts and, and your gut and really go ahead and do it and, and then even move further out of your boundaries and, and go to other locations and try to commit and, and do your research, which is what I did. It was not easy because I had to travel the entire country from Cap Haitian in the north all the way to Port-au-Prince, all the way to the north and the south, and I mean Las Caobas and San Marc and when I, I mean every, everywhere I was. But it was worth doing all that, all that work and all that uh, findings. So um, what I found out in the next slide the experience that they have is uh, that they, they feel so many different things. We're not going to go one by one on the here, but it's like they feel we can continue to the next slide because it's like they are being stuck. They are they living in pain. They, are, they have social disintegration. They are lonely. They are isolated. They are have social abandonment. They, they feel unsafe. They have no opportunities. They lack access to physical therapy. I mean, the list, like I said, also it goes on and on and on because imagine living in a world with a wheelchair in a country that doesn't really help you move around or have access or um, in a way it's, it's very, very complicated, but it can be done. Uh, in the next slide, you see like here, and in, 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 this was part of my qualitative research and the people, we came to the conclusion that they feel stuck, that they are not doing anything. They are depressed, they cannot admit their situation. They think too much, that's what they say. They don't move and they don't go places. So they, they cannot even go to church. So that feeling is of being stuck, stuck in their wheelchair, stuck in their life, stuck in their, environment, they, they, they don't see a way out. Then the next one that I, I did uh, find out was that they were always living in pain. And I'll come back to tell you because um, how I started this, um, this program is because my son, Luis, Luis Andres, he had a car accident when he was 18 years old and he's paralyzed from the waist down. So um, right now it's been 28 years since he's paralyzed. And um, I know all about uh, living with pain, all the conditions that these poor people have. Imagine that we have all the media and all the mediums of helping him. Imagine living in a poor country in a setting that it's not like so friendly that you don't have the means of, of getting medicine or getting all of that. So I really understand nobody can really tell me the pain that they live with because I've lived with him. I'm his caregiver most of the time. I'm always by his side. I know how he suffers. So I know the pain of these people. Their, their body aches. aches. It's all, they are always in pain. They never find like a solution to the pain. Even in this case, they say that even when they were sleeping, uh, the pain wakes them up. It's like inside their bones. They really don't know where it is. It is happening to my son now that it's like all over his body in the middle of the, of the body, like on the stomach and going down his legs. And nobody can really figure out what's going on. It seems to be more like a neurological pain, which happens after a few years of being uh, paralyzed. They are doing a lot of studies, which I will tell you when we get to the Walk About Foundation, what we are doing also with that, with the research. In the next slide, um, the people also feel that they are, have a um, social disintegration, that they are not having any future at all. Um, they always think how they were and how they are now. 
So they, they really feel like they have lost everything in the world. So they are really sad. They become very depressed. On the next one, we have, um, next slide, you see it's loneliness and isolation. Of course, they are lonely because a lot of people don't want to deal with people with disabilities. They are always in bed alone. And like one of our um, people that I interview, he said, I wake up, I'm in bed alone, I wake up alone. It's only God and my cell phone and me in the house. Imagine how sad. It's like they lose friends. The friends don't want to come and see them anymore because it becomes a burden to take them out, to move them. So they feel completely, completely lonely and they feel humiliated. Even people don't want to talk to them. So we have to try to change that stigma and that way of thinking of, in, it, not even in Haiti, it's around the world, everywhere. The next one, they have a social abandonment. It's about the same thing and humiliation. We have a case of a little girl that when I met her, her father, she was uh, in a wheelchair and she became, you know, after the earthquake, she was paralyzed. And she could still do a lot of things because she would do a beading and, and necklaces and little things to help herself. But she even told me that her father said that she was worth nothing anymore. I mean, she, he, he didn't want to even have her at home. So she felt humiliated, she felt abandoned. I mean, it's, it's very, very hard on them. And, and I know what they feel and it's, it's everywhere. The next one, they feel, um, they feel unsafe also. Of course they feel unsafe because they are in a wheelchair. They are more vulnerable. So imagine they, come, they tell us that when they see them, uh, let's say a taxi comes and, or a car, what they do is they drive even faster. A motorcycle, we drive faster to try to catch them or they yell at them, what are you doing here? You should be at home, uh, you are worth nothing. So they, they are completely unsafe. They rather sometimes stay at home than go out and, and be in the world and enjoy a little bit life with their friends because they don't feel safe. They have no way of transportation. People don't want to stop when they see a, a wheelchair in these poor setting countries. They, where would they put the wheelchair in the top of the tap tap or it's, it's, it's not easy for them. So we have to understand their life, how it is. And they are, in the next slide, many of them told us that also they have no um, future, like no opportunities. Imagine if in the real world where we are struggling to get a job, these people are in a wheelchair and are suffering, are having, the health is not good either. So they are, it's impossible then to, 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 not impossible, but it's not easy for people to give them a job because they're thinking, how are they coming fast to their work or how are they going to get here? What if they get sick? So they are, to find a job is very, very difficult for them. So the economy situation then struggle, they have to struggle because they have no means. And the next one is that they have no access to physical therapy. Most of them, they told us, because they, are, have, they don't have facilities around them. Imagine they live all over the place. They don't live near a hospital. Impossible to, to all be around there and, and move their families just to those places. So what they, they are asking us to give them more help in that case so that their lives would get better. If they would have a physical center in the area, they will be able to go, which after I joined uh, the program at the Mirabele Hospital that Harvard has in Haiti, we uh, opened a physical therapy, beautiful physical therapy center, which they are helping not only the people that are being operated or needed, or but they, all the other people around the community that they can come and have a physical therapy and, and even talk to them and everything. So the next one, um, so what is the impact that has um, having a wheelchair in the life of these people, right? So um, here we have a, 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 a person, you know, that after we came to the conclusion, they tell you that the wheelchair is the extension of their identity, the extension of their legs. It's a new pair of legs, it's not the same one, but at least, you know, they, they we give them dignity, we bring them out of from the floor or what they were struggling, 
they feel more um, uh, like a person. They can talk to everybody at the same level, mostly. So it's it's um, it's it's like it says this. It is perceived as the extension of one's identity. So the wheelchair also, they have told us after we, I never told them that we as a foundation give them a wheelchair. And I was just wanting to find out, you know, their opinion. I mean, their, their stories, their lives, their pains, their, all of the things that I have shared with you. But then after a while, then, you know, we asked them and like they, it says there, it serves them as a social integration. It helps them exercise. It promotes health because they are doing exercise. We don't give uh, an electric wheelchair unless it really they needed it because they are a quadriplegic. These are all paraplegics. So it, it liberates them. It gives them a different aspect in life. You can continue. It gives them a lot of dignity. It comes to their feet, like it says there, and um, is the most pressure thing that they ever had afterward. They use it as different pair of legs and it, they become their feet, like it, you can read there. And um, so they're really, really, um, how do you say it? They are very, um, well, they, they appreciate very much having a wheelchair. For them, it's a totally different world. And, and not only in Haiti, this is all over the world. Because I'll tell you with the foundation what we have done and what we have seen, okay? As you can see here, this is in Haiti, in one of the places that we visited. They can even play basketball. They interact with each other. They have a social life. They move around. They go outside. They are not only lying on the bed and just waiting for life to go by. They, they can become a normal person. I mean, if you give them what they need, and they would even love to work. I mean, and they're really good at what they are doing. So here you can see that they, with the wheelchair, they can also be part of the society, part of the community. They can interact with other people, okay? So uh, this, this um, person that we interviewed here, uh, he was left paralyzed after the earthquake. But like you can see that um, he's very, very strong and very happy and he keeps doing exercise and, and he will tell us, okay, you can catch me if you run fast because with this wheelchair, I would outrun you. So he is very, I mean, he's in Haiti. And the next one. So it, I, like I told you before, it becomes a social integration because um, in the community, they can go out and talk to other friends they can even teach other people what it is to be living in, you know, in a, in a wheelchair with a disability, a mobility disability. And they can go to church. So their lives completely change once they have the wheelchair and they appreciate it very much. So in our mission is to really walk about here. We go now into walk about the foundation, which is the foundation of my family that was started by my son, uh, not immediately after he had his accident. It was like a few years later with my daughter, Carolina, that uh, she was already, uh, had started everywhere and, and was working in a very hedge fund. And she came one day to visit my son at home and uh, we saw that there was no uh, access to wheelchairs in, around the town where we live, so she decided that she was going to change with her, with him the world, not only for, for my son, it was really for the rest of the people to have awareness and to restore dignity to people, to give them freedom, independence, to be, you know, um, to, to give them like a life. So um, she decided to create, to launch a Walkabout Foundation in, in 2000, and it was 2009 when it was launched, and we did it by walking the, the way of St. James, which is the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. We did the 990 kilometers walking, and Luis became the first person in the history of the, of the way of St. James in Spain to do it with his two arms, and the power of his arms in a wheelchair. So, um, that's my son Luis with my daughter Carolina, the two that started the, the foundation in 2009. 
And uh, we keep on working very hard to this day all the time, like to keep on, I'll tell you a little bit about where we are today. So in the next slide that we had, um, in the countries that we're working, well, there, yeah. So in the countries that we have been now um, doing wheelchair and rehabilitation programs, we are, as you can see, well, I don't know if you can see, Oh, Monica, we lost your we lost your sound. Can you, oh, <clears throat> Nia, Uganda, Ukraine. Okay, Ukraine, Venezuela, Rwanda, Sierra Leone. I mean, we're everywhere that you can imagine. A lot in Africa, a lot in Central America, a little bit in South America, and as you can see now, we have expanded to these other countries. We are in uh, India. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit um, about also, let's see the next slide. So here you see we have um, our place in Kenya that we do a lot of uh, work in Kenya with, we have a center that walk about, uh, has, uh, I mean, we keep, we keep, we, it's our center, so we keep it running and we hire people that are already in wheelchairs with mobility disabilities, as you can see them, and they assemble the wheelchairs that we can get and we are provided sometimes. And um, we have donated their 5,500 wheelchairs to this day. So about 81% um, of, of the people with disabilities are um, come from, from the, uh, in, in Kenya. So, um, in Kenya also, uh, there are about 7.7 .7 million people with disabilities. And we have given rehabilitation in this center to 100 children per year, we do it. And we have a um, charity Nana, excuse me? Sorry, the oh. sound went out, but it's back now, sorry. Oh, well, okay, sorry, sorry, I didn't realize. Um, so we have a um, person in, 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 in a wheelchair, which is charity and she runs our center. And we also have rehabilitation there for all these children. And now we started a new program there that is uh, creating uh, reusable diapers. So we buy the material, we hire the women that are in a wheelchair, they sew them, we, we get everything and we distribute it to the people that need for the children, all these diapers that they can. Next, uh, uh, the next, yeah. So uh, our work in Kenya, as you can see here, this is our rehabilitation center um, in Yuki. And um, so we completely uh, have, we are the ones that keep on with this center. I mean, it belongs to us so, and we, we, uh, we provide everything. We provide the, the people, everything. Our work in Uganda, also, we have donated 2,500 wheelchairs and trikes up to this day, and there are about four, um, 45 million people with disabilities there. And, um, but also, Uganda has a very special place in, in our hearts too, because a lot of re from refugee camps um, from South Sudan, they come, they, they come uh, to Uganda, so we have to, from Kenya, we send the wheelchairs to Uganda, so that is a very complex um, mechanism that we have to do um, in order to, to keep on going and, and distributing them. It's not easy. And there are a lot of the wheelchairs that are for children that need a lot of special um, components and special people that know how to feed them. It's not just sitting them there. We have, I'll tell you in a little bit about our uh, trainers. So the next one, uh, here we are, we work in South America also, in Argentina, as you can see, we have even in Venezuela, we were able to go. And also in Uganda and, and Kenya and in Venezuela, we're starting to, to try to find out a program that is working, that it's a, what's happening with the wheelchairs. 
and uh, keep a, a control of, of who gets them if they are, you know, because the children grow and then we have to change them. They are not, um, they are very good because they are rock riders, most of them, and which means that they are made with bicycle parts. They can be repaired in Africa and, and in countries that they don't have a lot of equipment. So they are very good. They are different ones also. That's the rock rider there with the little girl. But there are other ones that are like on the top with the little boy that has the tray. And um, so they need repair most of the times. And we have these centers that can repair them. Mostly the center would be in Kenya, in India. In Haiti, we have one in the north. The next one, we are also, as you can see, in our work in the Caribbean uh, and in, in in Central America, mostly in the Caribbean, we are, like we said, in Haiti, we are in the Dominican Republic. We have um, we have given in Haiti like about 6,600 wheelchairs to this day. Um, in, mo in overall, about 7,500 wheelchairs in the Caribbean and Central America. So that's about the number. So as you can see, I'm up there in the in the picture with the little boy that's in the Dominican Republic. And uh, but we are all over. We are all constantly working and providing them wheelchairs and changing their needs and bringing specialists to fit them. The next one here, our work in Haiti. As you can see in the middle slide, that's our center where we mostly um, have wheelchairs there to be distributed with like about 34 other partners that we have in Haiti. And um, so in Haiti, um, it's about, like I said, 6,600 now wheelchairs we have given them. and. Um, and approximately 4% of the population, some have, they have some kind of a, of a disability, a form of disability. But our work continues there, even though the situation is very hard. As you can see, we are up in the north and with, um, we are with a, a, what used to be the Haiti Hospital Appeal, which is now helping hands, um, helping hands of, in Haiti. Um, in India, we have also, uh, we don't, uh, we, we really in India now do more a rehabilitation. We have the center and we're doing rehabilitation and uh, it's very successful. And we're also in India trying to educate a lot of the people about the discrimination that they have against um, the people with disabilities and also the stigma that, that it is in the culture of having a disability is something not well seen. So a lot of education is going on in India in our part. And, but mostly we have the center for rehabilitation. And if they need a, a wheelchairs, we provide them, but we don't assemble them in this center, that it's ours. So as you can see here, um, this is the, the walkabout um, center in Kenya, in Nanyuki. And a lot of these, all these people that you see in wheelchairs, they, are, they work there. And even um, Charity, which is the lady in the blue pants, she's the head of the center. So constantly we're going back and forth all the time to see them. Um, I don't know if we have there, but we, are, we also do a lot of, do we have another uh, slide? Uh, yeah, that, thank you. Thank you very much. That's like the end of, of my presentation. Um, that's the end of my presentation when I did my thesis, which I thank everybody a lot. But I wanted to tell you also that we do a lot of also research with... Um, um, we do the research here in the United States. And at the more present time, we are working with the Dr. Monica Perez, which is with the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Chicago. And we're providing funds for uh, trying to find a cure for paralysis. She does these uh, trials, which is now with 15 candidates. And it's all um, just uh, nothing like um, uh, invasive. But we are working with her. We used to be with the Miami Project to cure paralysis, and we used to be with Dr. Le uh, Regia Egerton in UCLA. 
but we are doing now our research program, which we also donate about. We've done like, given like about $2 million to the present time to this doctor right there in 2022. And from 2021 to 2022, we've given her money. And Dr. Monica Perez is on the right with the right shirt. Um, we, we are very also, like I wanted to share with you that we are very careful with uh, who do we do our suppliers and um, which more of, a lot of our suppliers come from free well mission who donates entire containers. And we buy a lot from class, which is a US aid related company. And uh, we, we only, like I said, we assemble the uh, chairs in Kenya at the moment, and we make a lot of also repairs and modifications, and we provide therapy there. In Uganda and Haiti, we have partners with more permanent, permanent setups, and we provide a number of modifications and repairs. And in India, we are in Barasani town, and our partners is Jivan Joyti. So we travel all over the world. We continue to bring hope to people in need. And um, this is a program that I really, really thank Joya and Paul Farmer for giving me the opportunity of belonging and on being one of the seeds that they have, in, they have planted in the world, like all of you that are listening or might be doing the program, which I would love you to do. But all of you that are doing it, we are the seed that they picked up from all over the world and brought it to them to teach us how to do it and give it back to the world. So we are uh, harvesting what, what they taught us. So it's a very, very important program that we all have to encourage people to do it. Never, you know, think that you cannot do it because there are many opportunities in different aspects of life. I mean, we were all with different, we all come with, with different problems, which is the, the beauty of this program. That is not, we are not all alike. We are all different. So I encourage everybody to really please think about it. Tell your friends and pass the word, the, the voice. I mean, tell everybody about what you're doing. Life continues. and. Let me tell you one thing. Uh, because of this program that I did, I had the opportunity. The last container that we sent, where do you think it went? It went to Ukraine. Why did it go to Ukraine? Which is a very difficult place that we could be in three weeks ago. You know what happened? I met somebody by chance, because it was by chance, that I could talk about what I did with the program of the Masters of Medical Science in Global Health Delivery. And that helped me to open up and, and ask for these grants, which you wouldn't believe it. I mean, what support me? It was this program because they saw, oh, this is serious. This is what they're doing. This is what they're teaching. I told them all about it. And so they, they gave us the grants, which is amazing. And they will continue to do it. And where did we go with the container? To Ukraine, which is what they wanted us at that moment now to do it. So I'm encouraging every one of you to please think about it. We are the seeds that are being planted all over the world to bring harvest and, and hope. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for your kind words about the program, Monica. Hey. Oh, I love it. I love it, really. Yeah. So I'll let Julia go now. I just wanted yeah. to say that. Just so thank you me. so much, Monica. And, you know, we're, we're just so delighted that you're an alumni and oh, we're so proud you. of everything you did in the program and what you've accomplished before and since. Um, I think that, um, you know, your research was so powerful uh, because it was really deep, interviews with people yeah. and I think for many many folks uh, we don't realize that without a wheelchair people are living on the floor I mean just that that sort of image is so powerful um, I'm going to start with a question by Dr. Frenet Leon who you know uh, yeah. well he was asking if walkabout has seen any increase in demand or anything like that with 
the situation that's happening in Haiti over the last five years now? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, yes, of course, in Haiti, we keep, like I say, we even, even I can tell you that to this day, we have in that center that I showed you in the north, which is our partners with um, uh, Healing Hands, and uh, we have like about a thousand more wheelchairs and we've given them and we distribute them with different hospitals and different places, 600 wheelchairs we gave them. So yes, we keep on seeing the necessity. And not only that, you know, people don't have a wheelchair to have a bath, to take a bath. So what they use is they use their own wheelchair, which makes it then deteriorate faster. It rottens, it gets the damage, I mean, it's not a chair to be to take a shower because it's the chair that you live in. I mean, that's your your life, your 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 wheels, your, your legs. So because they don't have it, so it gets damaged easier. So then we have to go back and supply another one, which is okay. I mean, if we see that they need it, they need it, and um, and people grow, the little kids grow. We're giving a lot of pediatric chairs, which we never used to before when we started. It's more complicated because we need the physical therapists that are that understand the necessity of these kids. And um, but we've done it, and so yes, it has grown and it keeps growing. Like not only in Haiti, all over the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's such a great uh, you know example of. This kind of work is not just for, you know, poor countries, it's for everyone. And, exactly. you know, leveraging the work you had done for Ukraine, can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, uh, it happened because, uh, like I say, it's like God, I think, put this person in my life at the right time, at the right moment. And he was the head of philanthropy of Bloomberg. Oh, okay. So, so that's how I could, like in a way, you know, get into that. But how did I get into that program or, or with them, with the philanthropy? It's because I had done my master's at Harvard with the medical school and, and that backed me up. That really is what helped all my effort and everything. Exactly, is, is I told them, look, you know, how what I have learned, I mean, and I went step by step, you know how I am when I get like passion, like I told them everything and they really, they, they thought like, yes, I mean, let's do it. So yeah. that's how then we got in contact. I put them, you know, with, with our people in, in, in London, which they also, it's a very small, our company, I mean, our foundation is very, very small. So we put them together and one thing led to the other and that's how, how it happened. Yeah. And um, then they, like they, I met them again and then they said that this is only the beginning. So great. we have a lot of things that we can do. That's great. In Haitian Creole, we have the saying, pi petit pi red, very small is the mightiest. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You start with, with one step. Yeah, and so, you know, uh, we have lots of, of people thanking you for this amazing work. Um, and Rene Dormesson is asking um, for contact information in Haiti, um, who's working in Haiti. And uh, Rene, we can, Dr. Dormesson, we can, we can put you in touch with the Walkabout Foundation. Exactly. Um, and similarly, you know, Frené had a follow-up question about decentralizing the wheelchairs to the health center level too. Are there places where you're working in the health center or is it always pretty centralized to the hospital? No, it's not centralized. I mean, if they come and ask us through our partners, which are Healing Hands uh, in, of Haiti, uh, which is a Canadian company, and uh, they, they will, I mean, they just have to go and ask and we will deliver them, we will give them. I also told uh, um, Nadesh, Nadesh and, and, and um, Kobel, mm -hmm. too big, that in case they need it, they can only have to ask us because at this moment, it happens to be that we're very lucky that we have some wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. We had 1,600 
that we were able to get out the containers, which is not easy to get out of container yeah. in Haiti with all the political, you know, problems and, 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 and unsteadiness, and then to have them and then to open this new center that we have, a warehouse, because um, so that they would keep them there and distribute them, whoever needs them. Mm -hmm. We will do it. Great. I think we, um, yeah, so one of the things that I think is so interesting um, that you, that the, the organization does is teaching people how to put together the chairs and repair the chairs. Um, it gives them some skills and it's, a, you know, a very empowering strategy, I think. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And are there people who um, really, kind of try to, 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 you know, work on that more, have a business or help others? Yeah, um, mostly we, our, our center that does that is in Kenya. And uh, we have taught them how to help, you know, because we have the center to, to assemble them right there. So which we would like to have that same center uh, as an assembly in, in Haiti, which is one of our, our goals, but uh, not easy at the moment. But yes, I mean, we teach them and then we keep bringing more people so that they are not only in that center, but that they could be distributed further out the center where they live or, or other places. And um, we many times we have to buy the parts that they need. So we are the ones that provide the parts because we buy them. And other times they can manufacture or try to adjust the, the wheelchair or, or their setting or whatever they need with foam or with multiple, you know, um, materials that they, that they need because that's what they do. And people come there to be repaired. But what you said, we use the people and we not use them, but we, we give them the work so that they feel productive. They love to come to work every morning and um, as well as the ladies and the women that are also working with the diaper, reusable mm -hmm. diapers and trying to give them jobs. I mean, yeah. no matter what, but they, that's in my thesis, you know what they were always telling me that they wanted? Please give jobs. me a job. Yeah. I give me a job. I want to do something. I don't want to feel that I'm like a, useful. no useful. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so really that's one of the most important things that we could contribute in the world is trying to bring them in. Yeah. You know, Monica, one question that just came up from Dr. Annabelle Singerland is, you know, what is the work that you see <clears throat> for changing perspectives on, you know, what people can do in society? She mentions, you know, uh, people with disabilities like Frida Kahlo, or how do we change the perspective um, how do you, how would you, you, you know, talk about that? How do we change people's perspectives? I would say society? that the most, yeah, the most important thing would be education. We have to change the, you know, educate people starting from schools, that we are all created the same. Just because you have a different pair of legs doesn't mean that you're not human. I mean, you are the same. It's education, education, education because that's how it starts, like the stigma, the, the, the people, how, how discriminate against them. They feel that they are worth nothing, no more. No, they are exactly like us. They just need a little bit more of help maybe, but mm -hmm. if we can change that way of, of people seeing them with education, which has to start in schools, so then we can change the world the way they see them. Yeah. That's what I think, because, I mean, we can give them a lot of things to do, but yeah. people, not, not only them, is the rest of the people the problem. Yeah. They don't want to include them. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, one of the things this highlights for me is the extraordinary amount I have learned from you, Monica, and from many of the participants that come through the master's program, because people come with a passion and it's yeah. often a passion in an area that's been very, very neglected. Um, and so really 
saying that global health has got to be for everyone. Delivery of care has to be for the most vulnerable first. And when we uncover these vulnerabilities, um, our work is, is enormous, but a lot of it is education. And so you've done that so well. Um, Comfort, uh, one of our alumni from Nigeria, hi Comfort. Um, she was asking if you can explain a little bit more about the production of the reusable diapers and how you see that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's working well because a lot of the people that we give rehabilitation in our center, they need, you know, the, the mothers come with children and the children need the diapers. So in these poor setting countries, I mean, they don't have the disposable diapers that we have always have, you know, and we're used to now. And in, I remember when my first son was born, I was using reusable diapers. It was that you would sew, it was cloth, and you would wash them and dry them. And here they live in places that they have a lot of sun also. Mm -hmm. So it really works because we give them the material, they sew them, you know, we give them the machine and, and they are sewn and everything and then washed and then we give them to the mothers and they are really happy. And we're doing two, two things at a time, giving them work to the people that are in, in, in a wheelchair and helping the mothers with all the newborns. So uh, they're really for, for children. Uh, what about the adults who, who need diapers for incontinence? Um, and we, are you I'm all sure that we're gonna continue with, on, that, on that path. Uh -huh. It's just starting now with the children and we find that it's really working and the people are very happy and the people producing them are more happy and they are also being paid because they are doing a job. I mean, it's, they're learning another skill. So we can continue with this um, type of work and like many others that we could teach them and do things. It's yeah. just, it, yeah, it takes, it takes the materials. It takes a lot of, you know, you have to have a center, you have a place where they can come in, the electricity. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, a question from Walid Rabani, uh, who is, um, has, uh, hopefully will be coming to our program. Um, wonders if you could share your experience about multiple countries in terms of advocacy with the government for walkabouts work and were there any challenges that you faced at that level? Uh, yes, of course, thank you. Uh, yeah, in, in all the countries, we have to partner with somebody. We cannot just go in and, and take over and say, we're coming here and we're donating. No, we always partner with somebody before going, somebody that we feel that are responsible, that are well-known, and that they are gonna help us find the people that we're gonna give the wheelchairs. Usually a container has about 300 wheelchairs. So, um, so once we partner with them, we go to the distribution, we, we send the container first, we get it out of customs, which is hard sometimes with the different governments. Like in Haiti it was getting very, very difficult, but we keep struggling and, and fighting and we get them out. And in many other countries, it happens also. I mean, we've been in Cuba, we've been in Venezuela, we've been, you, you name it, places that are not even easy sometimes to, to get them in Sudan. We've been in Sudan and get them out and then even distribute them. Mm -hmm. But if you have this, you know, logistic that we do it before we go, then we send our people that are trained with us or that work with us, our, our foundation is small, but we try to be present at the time of the delivery. So always somebody from Walkabout Foundation being London based or based here or the United States, you name it, will go with them. And we hire the specific um, physical therapist that would come with us mm, from different right. places. And they do it mostly as a volunteer job, mm. but also we give them, I mean, we pay for their, for their ticket transportation under mm -hmm. the place where they will stay, but their work, they mostly do it as a volunteer, which is very nice. And they're really, really trained yeah. in different aspects because children are very hard to, to, to feed. Hmm. 
Yeah, you know, um, another question about that is, you know, how much have you been able to tap into some of the, you know, amazing spirits of, of, you know, the people who are using wheelchairs and who have disability mobility, but are willing to be activists? Is that something that you have been able to incorporate in your strategy? We try. I mean, we try very much. And um, it's difficult because in different countries, it's different uh, aspects of, you know, you have to be very careful. And But completely as a one activist, we don't have in every place that, you know, like we have it in Kenya, which uh, with a charity. We have it in India where we have our center. And uh, so they keep uh, talking and, and working on that aspect. But in other countries that we just go, uh, mostly it's to, to give them the wheelchair and try to come back and then find out how it's going and that type of thing. But we always work with the government too. We're not just jumping in without you know, the consent or something. They know what we're doing, and which is perfectly fine with us. Even when we went to Pakistan, they were very surprised that we were able to, to get a visa to go, my daughter and myself, Carolina and myself, to Pakistan. And we were in Lahore, we were in Islamabad, we were, I mean, you name it. And we did, gave all the wheelchairs. The ambassador, American ambassador, was very surprised one day that he found us there. And he was like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> but, but we did it, and, and it was really, like something that we will never forget. Yeah. yeah, and it can be done. So if you have your your strength and your you know ability to keep on going and, and think more than what you can do, dream high, you can do it. And that's our philosophy. We always try for more and, and we keep fighting for everybody that is in a mobility disability. Uh, thank you so much, Monica. And you know, you. I want to read Jafet's comment because it's so beautiful and, and echo it, which is thank you also for sharing your lived experience as the caregiver of Luis and sharing how we turn our personal struggles into power. Um, and I think you know, we are indebted to your vision and your work. And we're just so grateful that you're an alumni of the program, the Thank second you. cohort. Yeah. Um, I called the first cohort guinea pigs. And Frene uh, Leand corrected me and said pioneers. So you were one of our pioneers. That's um, true. I will never forget the picture of you, Jafet, and Nadej on a motorcycle. In Haiti. <laughs> um, in Haiti. But... Um, Thank you so much. What a beautiful presentation. And of course, we are all supporting you from afar and, you know, giving our love to your family and Luis particularly. And thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for being one of the seeds that you planted in the world to harvest all these and to find you in the airport in the exactly airport. and to find me in the, <laughs> at the airport that's true my sister is here with me and she's remembering that's true that the way we met that we found each other in malawi yeah and that that look where it brought us together and it, we will keep on working and and strive you know doing our best to to keep on We'd love to see some some day of a you know person with a mobility disability in the program. Yes, of course. Now that, yeah. that would be amazing, amazing. I keep telling everybody about your program and that if I can do it, they can do it. I mean, and that they always Harvard will do anything to make you succeed, and they are the best, which is true. And look at all the things that they teach us. And, and I, I remember I remember when I started, and one of the questions at the beginning of the program was, what do you think of the number of people that we were? Remember, we were eight. And I said, oh my God, you're so kind, Harvard, to give us the best professors, the best everything for only eight. So you have to make it more. So this has to 
Grow, grow and keep on growing. The best program. Uh, I'll, I'll just yeah. say, I'm sorry to, to, um, to note this, but um, Monica, just so you know, back in 2021, it was, we were getting ready for the 10th anniversary and we put together um, a slideshow for Joya to give to the senior faculty in January of 2022. And just all the things the program has accomplished and how many amazing alumni we have and all the articles they've published and the work they've done. And of course you were part of that. And Joya presented that um, at the faculty meeting and Paul was there in January, 2022. So sorry, I'm tearing up a little bit. He got to see all this work that, that you and the alumni have done and really kind of celebrate that. Um, and then the other thing is in 2021, we, we got, we had 20 people enter the program, 20. And that was the number Paul was like, I want 20 to enter. So he got to see that. And so even though we miss him so much, I try to think of those things that he, you know, you and the other students and alumni in this program really did, did make Paul's wish come true for this program. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. The trust they have in all of you. Yeah, them. that's true. Plus all the trust that you all have in all of us. And um, we, we will keep on working. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Joya, for this amazing opportunity. And thank you. For we'll great, always be part. Great talk. All right. So we'll end the public, oh, sorry. We'll end the public portion of this talk. Um, we will have another talk um, uh, on health systems May 5th. So we will send out emails to you all and we'll follow up with an email to those who registered so you can um, attend that talk in future ones as well. But we just want to say thank you so much for joining us today and we wish you all a wonderful day.